I'm sure many of you have heard the phrase toxic masculinity. It's one of those ideas that gets brought up a lot, but is never really justified. It's just kind of assumed as a starting point before talking about some other issue. So today I'd like to investigate a little, and the first question I'd like to bring up is, what does toxic masculinity even mean? The short answer is, I don't know. Some people use it to mean hyper-masculinity, but other people say it's any amount of masculinity. It really depends who you ask. Perhaps a more specific question, and a more useful question, would be, to whom is masculinity toxic? Dictionaries and academic sources usually claim that it's toxic to men themselves because it makes them feel inadequate and not manly enough, but individual feminists often claim that the real victims are women because men feel the need to be aggressive and violent. Regardless of who you agree with, I think the most important thing to point out in these discussions is the fact that, regardless of who it hurts, any behavior can be toxic. Any behavior can be toxic, so to speak, in extreme amounts, both extremely high and extremely low, and depending on the circumstances. For example, take the often cited toxic masculine trait of emotional flatness. It can be bad in high amounts when dealing with personal problems, but it can also be very good in high amounts when facing a physical or logistical challenge. As an example of this, search for everyday heroes on YouTube, and notice that it's mostly men who, for example, jump onto the train tracks to save the kid, or who walk through traffic to help an old person. You really can't do these things unless you suppress your fear and give priority to the situation. As another example, take aggression. Is aggression toxic or not? Well, it depends. My main problem with the way many feminists talk about masculinity is the fact that they don't seem to make any of these distinctions. To them, it seems that a trait is either good or bad, regardless of the situation, and sometimes regardless of the amount as well. And surprise, surprise, guess which gender-typical traits are singled out for that gender to correct about themselves. I mean, after all, women are just helpless animals floating in the raging sea of our patriarchal culture that men created. So, any toxic traits that women may have are forever beyond their control, right? I mean, once we fix masculinity, that'll somehow fix everything, right? And unfortunately, that does bring us to the question, what about toxic femininity? I know, I know, it's, it's a tired talking point, what about toxic femininity? I know the accusation has been leveled a million times, but let me just give you my summary of it, hopefully in a more constructive way than most people have summarized it in the past. This accusation is usually leveled at people who defend their use of the phrase toxic masculinity by saying that they just want to help men deal with unrealistic expectations and being forced into gender roles, which is certainly admirable and sounds very altruistic, but it's also very curious, because if that were the case, you would expect these people to also be concerned about what they would call toxic femininity, since you could just as easily apply these descriptions to women in those exact words, if not more so than men. After all, you hear feminists talk about unfair standards and gender roles all the time as they pertain to women, but curiously, they never identify these things as toxic femininity, despite calling the exact same things toxic masculinity when they apply to men. So what's going on here? In my experience, most gender feminists would respond to the question of toxic femininity by saying something like, masculinity is toxic because it's men holding themselves to impossible or harmful standards, whereas femininity is not toxic because, while women are also held to impossible and harmful standards, women aren't the ones perpetuating those standards, and women aren't the ones who created those standards thousands of years ago. It was all men. So, toxic femininity is just another word for patriarchy. Or, to put it a little less charitably, they would say, women don't have any significant influence on our culture, and they never have. So everything that's bad about our culture and its gender roles is entirely men's fault. If you're doing it to yourself, it's toxic. But if it's being done to you, it's oppression. No matter how you phrase it, I call bullshit. Women do affect culture, women do have influence on gender roles, and women do generate and enforce ideas about men and other women. Just like men do. Ooh, right, but that makes it sound like women have even a tiny amount of agency, so you know that can't possibly be an accurate description of the Western world, right?
Just as an example, if we believe that wearing makeup is a female typical behavior because men tend to value the appearance of their partner more than women do, then how can anyone turn around and say that gauging your social status by how much money you earn, a male typical behavior sometimes cited as toxic, how can they turn around and say that that has nothing to do with the fact that women tend to value the financial situations of their partners more than men do? The people who say that toxic femininity is just a synonym for patriarchy seem to believe that women have no preferences for the men around them, that women have absolutely no standards, that all men are interchangeable, all men are equally attractive, and all men are equally pleasant to be around. Or, that men simply have no desire to appeal to women, and never have. Big blue pants, when you no longer care if you're attractive to women. <laughs> Alright, now that we've covered the big picture items, I'd like to address some specific points that people have raised about toxic masculinity. I won't be able to cover every relevant claim, but I think I've collected a decent sampling. First, we have the idea that violence is part of toxic masculinity. It's time to make connections between the epidemic of men's violence in our country and what society is teaching boys about masculinity. The summit is the work of the Healthy Masculinity Action Project, an ambitious initiative devoted to starting a national conversation about how masculinity is defined and to challenge the normative idea that being violent is essential to being a man. The project will engage teachers, coaches, business leaders, parents, and young men in modeling strength without violence. Well, I hate to break it to you, just kidding I don't, but violent is just the extreme case of being strong, assertive, and having things under control. Being violent is essential to being a man in the same way that having the flow rate of a fire hydrant is essential to being a shower. No one really expects it, and it's not very much appreciated because at that point, it becomes more of a hindrance than a benefit. It may be jokingly mentioned as an absurd extreme, but very few people actually praise it when it's done for real. I didn't drink milk! This claim that violence is part of masculinity is often found in conjunction with the idea that toxic masculinity is men not being able to control themselves. From the same article, we read, That's why the real question isn't if men are more or less violent. The real question is whether or not men have control over themselves. Here is some breaking news, patriarchy. Ooh, speaking directly to the patriarchy. Men can control themselves. They do it all the time, day in and day out, all over the world. Men demonstrate that they are capable of control, kindness, empathy, compassion, and humanity. Okay, so specific to this article, why are you inviting non-rapist men to a summit on correcting bad, male-typical behaviors? Oh, right, because having the same genitals as the majority of rapists makes their crimes partially my fault. Or, perhaps because there is a well-understood link between verb tense, she was raped versus he raped her, and actual crime rates. This is a broad issue I have with the way many feminists apply their ideas to the real world. Individuals are not groups. Men don't have control over themselves, as a group, any more than women have control over other women. Although I think it's amusing to point out, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, that women actually have a lot of control over men since they're usually the ones who raise and teach young boys. So, if you're hell-bent on blaming an entire gender, it's not exactly an easy out for women, just saying. Anyway, in terms of controlling your entire gender, it turns out that, in the United States, we've actually written laws which effectively state that women can't control themselves. But I don't hear feminists complaining about these laws. These are called safe haven laws. These laws designate many public buildings like police stations, fire stations, and hospitals as places where people, mothers, are legally allowed to drop off very young babies, no questions asked. That's a little weird, so why were these laws written? Well, they were written because a shocking fraction of new mothers would throw their living, crying babies into dumpsters simply because they didn't want them. In response to this, safe haven laws became widespread in the 1990s, even though abortion had already been legal for 20 years at this point, and even though you can give babies away to the adoption system. Given this state of affairs, you can't help but wonder where are all the feminists turning a critical eye to women, as a group, and demanding that women stop baby dumping? Men can stop rape, but women can't stop baby dumping. It's almost as if, when it's their turn to face the whip, they suddenly realize that this simply isn't how society operates. <laughs> 
Moving on, we have the idea that we need to vote on a new version of masculinity. In the 21st century, I believe we need a different sort of manhood, a democratic manhood. The manhood of the future cannot be based on obsessive self-control, defensive exclusion, or frightened escape. We need a new definition of masculinity in this century, a definition that is more about the character of men's hearts and the depths of their souls than about the size of their biceps, wallets, or penises. A definition that is capable of embracing differences among men and enabling other men to feel secure and confident rather than marginalized and excluded. A definition that is capable of friendships based on more than common activities, what among toddlers is called parallel play, or even common consumer aesthetics. So in this sense, toxic masculinity really is the academic version of the phrase. It's masculinity which doesn't represent all men, and which makes a lot of men feel inadequate for not living up to one aspect or another of manliness. My objection to this is the fact that many aspects of the traits that we consider masculine and feminine did not appear randomly out of the ether, nor were they consciously created by some ancient power and bestowed upon all people like some kind of original sin. These categories of behaviors arose through observing the different ways in which men and women tended to behave throughout history, leading male-typical behaviors to be called man-like or masculine, and female-typical behaviors to be called female-like or feminine. And these classifications are validated every day so long as men and women continue to behave in noticeably different ways in aggregate. And yes, they are also reinforced by the human tendency to view things that are normal as also being normative. That's how things are, therefore that's how things should be. The fact that many aspects of masculinity and femininity arose organically in this way means that we cannot simply vote on a new meaning for the word masculinity any more than we can vote on a new meaning for the word loud. Words will always gravitate back toward describing what we actually see in the real world. Sure, we could agree to make the words themselves mean something else, masculinity now means being kind and nurturing, and loud now means a mid-level sound, not inaudible but not painful, but even if we somehow managed to get everyone on board with these changes, new words would arise to take the place of the old ones because the facts are inescapable, and people want a word that describes the fact that men and women tend to behave differently, and that some sounds have relatively high volumes. Masculinity and femininity are essentially just averages, and most individuals are not average in every single way. You might be average height, but not average height, weight, hair color, skin tone, and brain volume all at the same time. In the same way, most men do fall short of being masculine in one aspect or another. No matter what we choose masculinity to be, it will always be toxic in the sense that it will exclude most men in one aspect or another, because averages don't usually apply to individuals. The only way you could achieve non-toxic masculinity is if you defined it as something so trivial and basic that it applied to nearly everyone in a tautologically true way, making the word itself useless, and probably spawning a new word to take its place. I'll talk more about this later in the video. The solution is not to try and change masculinity in the hopes that this time we'll pick a meaning that all men are comfortable with, because that's just not possible. The votes are already in. The solution is to simply realize that no one person fits the average, and to realize that, because of how our brains are wired, we will always mistakenly try to enforce what we see as normal. I'll give you an example from my own life. One of my friends asked me how I style my hair, and I told him that I used hairspray. He laughed, and he half-seriously joked about me being feminine, I forget exactly what he said, but I told him, hey, it works and it's easy. And that was that. I didn't argue that using hairspray isn't unmanly, I just acknowledged that I'd missed the man goal on this one because it doesn't really frickin' matter. If you're someone who feels inadequate for being unmanly, that's kind of your problem to fix because masculinity is not about to change for you. Or, to use an analogy, if I were really good at basketball despite only being 5 foot 9, that's 175 centimeters, I would just have to accept that people will talk shit about me for not being tall yet still being a basketball player. That's just life. You cannot change the fundamentals of masculinity any more than you can change the idea that basketball players are tall. So the question now is, what is healthy masculinity? Specifically, my question is, can a man do anything that is distinctly masculine without it being toxic? How is healthy masculinity different from femininity? 
How is healthy masculinity different from just being a good person in general, regardless of gender? I've seen several lists of supposedly healthy masculine traits, but I have yet to find one where these traits are what I would call actually masculine, in the sense that they are more typical of men than of women. You can't call something masculine if it's not a male-typical behavior, by definition. And these traits, which people hold up as examples of healthy masculinity, seem no more male-typical than female-typical. Incidentally, the infamous feminist YouTuber Steve Shives was asked this very question, so what are some healthy masculine traits? And in his entire 13-minute video, he was not able to provide an answer. I think the problem is that, most of the time, the people writing these lists don't simply have a problem with toxic masculinity, but with all gender roles, so they will never be comfortable writing out a list of distinctly masculine traits. It will always feel wrong to them. To use an analogy, imagine some kind of vegetarian activist whose problem is not that people are eating the wrong types of meat, but that people are eating meat at all. Of course, they know that most people aren't going to take their true message seriously, so they try to sell people on what they call healthy meat eating, which could be a thing, not eating red meat, for example, but when you read their list of healthy meat, you realize that it's completely devoid of meat. Furthermore, imagine that every time you heard the phrase healthy meat eating, it was from the vegetarian and vegan club on campus. The phrasing kind of gives you away. In this same way, a person who believes that all gender roles and gender-typical behaviors are toxic will never be able to create a list of healthy masculine traits. If you are not comfortable generalizing specific behaviors to men or women, then you will never find a behavior that is both healthy and masculine. If you oppose all gender stereotypes, then you will never be able to generate a list of good gender stereotypes. Now, in response to this criticism, a person might say, well, these are just behaviors that we want men to typify in the future. Okay, so tell me, how are you going to get women to tone themselves down on these behaviors so that they can stand out as distinctly masculine? If you can't do that, then you're not reinventing masculinity, you're destroying it, and you should at least admit that. So what would healthy masculinity look like? I realize this video has been nothing but criticism so far, with no actual proposal of my own, because that's usually how I roll. But in the interest of actually proposing something constructive, I'd like to present a list of healthy masculine traits, which I think most people would have expected from feminists, but which I've never seen proposed. These are the kinds of traits that I would think of if I were hearing the term healthy masculinity for the first time, yet I've never heard these traits presented by feminists despite their repeated use of the term healthy masculinity. I present this list with the understanding that most men will not have all of these traits, that many women will have some of these traits, and that these traits can be good or bad depending on the amount and depending on the situation, just like any other behavior. So, number one, taking action. That whole thing about everyday heroes, home intruder scares, bump in the night, husband goes to check, that sort of thing. Number two, emotional strength. Similar to above, but also more to do with not internalizing insults or wallowing in sadness in lieu of trying to fix your situation. This is actually a contrast that my dad and my brother and I all experienced after my mom died. A few therapists we went to, they all happened to be women, never gave us guidance on what to do. They just wanted us to focus on how we felt in the moment, which none of us found very helpful. Number three is a lazy one, spatial awareness. You can actually demonstrate that men tend to perform better at these types of tasks. Okay, we'll put that on the list. Number four is speaking directly and saying what you mean. This is something that many women say they like about men, so put it on the list. Number five, being competitive. Not necessarily sporty, but the idea to turn something into a contest, even if it's some trivial bullshit, just because it's fun. And number six, career ambition. It's kind of similar to competitiveness, and it can be very good in a predominantly capitalistic society. And, much like number four, women tend to like this about men, so why not put it on the list? So there you go, that's my broad, not very specific overview of these ideas about toxic masculinity. I really don't know if there's a good way to tie everything together at the end of the video, so here's a cute puppy. Oh wait, sorry, I meant here's a cute cat. After all, cats are the solution to toxic masculinity. Somehow.